You have your Bibles, and I hope you do. We are in Joshua chapter 14, and whether you realize it or not, the last eight weeks we've been studying through Joshua and the life lessons, and actually today we're wrapping up the book of Joshua, and if, you're, if you know, there's 24 chapters. We're only at chapter 14. Well, let me just clue you. The next 10 chapters is battle after battle after battle after battle, and then there's a division of all the land, and he, as they conquer some land, then he's divided it among the 12 tribes of Israel, and it's a good read, and if you haven't actually read all the way through Joshua, I encourage you to do that, but for preaching purposes, we got to keep moving. And uh, so we spent eight weeks in Joshua, and there's a lot, a lot of lessons I pray and trust you've learned. Today, in the life lessons of Joshua, we learn from a man who we actually met at the very beginning of the series. Caleb is his name, and he was very much unlike Achan. If you were here last week, we studied from Achan. But uh, Caleb uh, is 85 years old, and he's actually setting for us the right kind of example. Achan made a mess of things. Go back to our website. You can listen to last week's sermon. But we actually can learn from Caleb some good examples. And I hope you take a few notes down from this today. But when you think about 85 years old, the story's told of a kid's Sunday school class, and they were going through the nursing home and getting a tour of the facilities. And one of the local residents saw the kids and asked, hey, well, do you all have any questions? And so a little girl kind of leaned in and she said, well, how old are you? And uh, the lady with great pride said, well, I'm actually 98 years old. And the girl, her eyes got so big and she was very clearly impressed with this. And she said, did you start at one Somebody else was talking about getting old, and they said, that when you get old, the only exercise you get is jumping to conclusions, climbing the walls, um, pressing your luck, throwing your weight around, and beating around the bush. That's about all the exercise that you can get. Or maybe you've heard the old proverb that says, old age is when you've got it all together, but you just can't remember where you put it. And anybody want to testify to that? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Caleb, in today's story, he actually had it all together, and he knew where he put it. And so if you're taking notes, jot some of this down. Some examples from Caleb's life that I think would benefit from us. And the first example from Caleb's life is that of persistence. Caleb's example of being persistent. You have to remember in the whole story, if you've been with us, Caleb had been promised a piece of property, but that was 45 years ago. And since that promise, you remember many times over, we've reminded you, they spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness and 40 years with a bunch of dissatisfied, unfaithful, whining, belly aching. And I'm sure it had to be a lot of fun for Caleb and these guys. I mean, I can't even imagine. I'm sure you would enjoy that, right? 40 years of wilderness and nothing but a bunch of complaining. But finally, those, those people all died off, and now here we are. Caleb is now entering into the promised land with Joshua, the two that were promised. Joshua's leadership. They spend the next five years, the Battle of Jericho we talked about. Last week was the Battle of, battle of Ai. And, and then there's a few other battles that have taken place. And so we pick up in the Scriptures... Uh, at the end of last week, they battled Ai, but they lost, remember, because of the sin of Achan. So they addressed the sin, and his family were taken care of. They actually go back and fight Ai again, and this time, because they dealt with the, the sin in the, in, the, um, in the family of Achan, they actually came out and they won. They honored the Lord, and they won the battle. So here we are, 45 years, Caleb is still holding on to the promises that God gave. Look at Verse, uh, it's 12 on the screen, but I want to start actually, I want to read verse 12 of chapter, or verse 10 of chapter 14. It says, now behold, the Lord has kept me alive just as he said. Now in some versions it says, just as he promised. Those 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke his words to Moses. Verse 12. So, because that's true, give me the hill country of which the Lord spoke of on that day. Folks, when God gives you a promise, you can take it to the bank. And that's what Caleb's saying. Hey, God promised, now give me the mountain. And we have to remember, God is always faithful, always keeping His promises, always keeping His word. You think about the promises that God's made. There's a book entitled All the Promises in the Bible. And the author went through and counted 7,457 promises of God. 
Now, if you were to read one promise a day, it would actually take you over 20 years to read all the different promises that are recorded in Scripture. If I dared try to preach a different promise every Sunday, it would take me 143 years to preach through all of those uh, promises. Now, I don't know if any of us are in it for the long haul, but what this tells me is that God has a lot to say to His children, does He not? It's a lot of promises that we can claim. And so, the Bible says in Numbers chapter 23, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he not speak and then act? Does he promise and not fulfill? First Kings and 8, it says, not one word has failed of all the good promises that he's given. Amen? Absolutely. If you would put your confidence, 100% of your trust, if you put that in anyone other than the Lord, I can assure you this, you will be disappointed because people will fail and they will let you down. Your friends will disappoint you. Your family will disappoint you. The places that you work for, they're going to disappoint you. You stay around here long enough, I'm going to disappoint you. But don't jump on me too quick because guess what? You will disappoint yourself from time to time just as well. And that's who we are. But folks, when you stand on the promises of God, God never fails and he will never let you down. So let me give you a challenge this week. In light of all these promises I've referenced, let me challenge you this way. This week, when you're in the Word regularly, please tell me that you're in the Word regularly. Listen, if you only show up on Sundays for a 25-minute sermon on Joshua, and that's all that you have associated with God's Word through the week, you will never grow strong in your faith and never have the walk and relationship with the Lord that He wants. You have to be in the Word regularly. So, this week, each day, when you're in the Word, here's your homework. I want you to read looking for the promises that God has made. Over 7,000 of them are made. There's a real good chance if you're in the Word every day this week, you're going to be able to underline, highlight, or just make a note of a promise that God's made. I want you to start looking for them. I want you to see them as you're reading. So there's a little bit of homework for you. I grew up and we had a bunch of the hymns. The oldest lady in the church played the organ. The preacher's wife played the piano Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That was my upbringing. And I know the song, we sing it all the time, standing on the promises of God. When all the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, it's by the loving word of God. Remember that song? By the loving word of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. It's by the word that we can stand on these promises. I love the story. It's told about this scrawny little kid. He was in high school in West Texas. And the high school was so small, they didn't even have a wrestling team. But the kid had read a book on wrestling. He was convinced he would like to do that. So he goes to his football coach and asks if he would sponsor him in some of these wrestling matches. Well, this little kid wasn't strong and he had no skill about him at all. But he'd read the book and he had one enduring quality. And that was the idea that he refused to give up. You guys remember that old movie called Rudy? It was about the football player at Notre Dame. Most guys have seen it. If you haven't, you ought to. Well, that's what this guy was like. He was just like Rudy, and he started the wrestling season, and he won. Then he won again. Then he won again. He went his entire season, and he was undefeated. So at the end of the story, he's made it all the way to the state finals in his weight classification. His opponent, however, happens to be a two-times all-state champ. Sure enough, he got in that wrestling ring and he started to wrestle. And in the blink of an eye, that state champion made a couple of quick moves. This guy was upside down on his back, ready to be pinned and ready to lose the match. Well, his football coach, his, his coach, his heart just broke for him. He said, I, I, can't even, I can't even watch. And so the football coach turned around and not even two seconds after he turned around, the, roar just bre- the crowd just breaks out into a roar. And he looks back over and that little kid was on top of that state champ, pinned him to the mat, won the match. That young kid just comes skipping across the map to his coach. Coach, coach, I won. Can you believe it? I won. And he said, yeah, I see that, but I thought you were getting ready to lose. I turned around. I didn't see what happened. What did you do? And he said, well, coach, that guy, he was a great wrestler, and he had me tied up like a pretzel, and I didn't know what else to do. But I opened my eyes, and I saw a big toe right in front of me. And I don't know if it's against the rules or not, he said, but I bit that toe with all my strength. Coach, it's amazing what you can do when you bite your own toe. (laughs) Only a wrestler could do that because I can barely touch my toes. (laughs) 
Listen, if you are ever tempted, and maybe there's people here today ready to give up on God's promises, and let me just say, you remember this little guy, and you take a grip and you hold on to the promises of God, and don't you dare let go, and don't you dare quit. Caleb was a great example for us to learn from. Not only being persistent, but he was an example for endurance. Jot that down. Caleb's example of endurance. Look back at your text, but turn one page to chapter 13 and verse 1. God is now reminding Joshua and Caleb that he was not through with them yet. And so you get to verse 1 and the scripture says, When Joshua was old and well advanced in years, the Lord said to him, You are very old. Now think about that. But yet there is still a very large area of land that needs to be taken over. Now listen, folks, if God calls you old, you are old. There's no way around it. But yet, he still had some work. He needed to use these octogenarians to kind of seal the deal. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, both. They're 85 years old. You'd expect God to say, hey, y'all have done a great job. You've led them into the promised land. You've done the things I've asked. Now, take a rest and let me get some of these young bucks to come in and just clean up the mess that we've started here. That's not what God said. And I so appreciate God not only preserved the promise for the man, 45 years they've been waiting, but God also preserved the man for the promise. He wasn't done with Caleb and Joshua yet. And I love that. Caleb was 85 years old before he ever moved into his inheritance. In fact, if you do a little homework, you'll find out six times in the Old Testament, Caleb is described, and here's the language that they used. Caleb, he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Six times, he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Man, wouldn't you like to be described that way? People talk about you and you're old and gray and you think you're done and the Lord's still using you. People say, hey, he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. If you're here today and you are 85 or older, I'm just curious. I won't embarrass you, but I'm just curious. If you're here today and you're 85 or older, would you just stand up for a moment? I don't know if it's easy to turn the house lights on. Let me see. 85 and older. One man. One man. Oh, I see a, I see a young lady standing back there, too. There's a couple of you. Three. Are y'all pop? Like, is this popcorn? You coming up on a... Yes. Yeah. It took a while to get up. That's right. Slow moving. (laughs) Says a young man over there. Listen, can I just say, we are so glad that you're here. And we acknowledge that you are wholeheartedly uh, following the Lord. That you're still making the church and you're making the Lord a priority in your life. And we want to applaud that for sure. We thank you for being here. I should have asked how many of you feel like you're 85 or older. Half the room would have probably stood up. Listen. Please, when you wholeheartedly follow the Lord, you will never retire from serving Him. Service may look different in how you serve the Lord, but you never stop serving the Lord. Many of you are involved right now in jobs that you're going to be allowed to retire one day, and that's fine, and that's good, and you deserve that. I don't have a problem with that. Some of you are here today, and you've already retired, but others would retire if it wasn't for health insurance and mortgages. You you want to retire and you're going to. It just hadn't got there yet. Retirement from a career can be a good thing. And there's not a thing wrong from from retiring from a job. You've earned it. It's well-deserved. I encourage you, go out and spend all of your kids' inheritance. Perfect. (laughs) That's our goal. But please hear me. God is not done with you. Whatever your age is, whatever season of life, God is not done with you. One day in the distant future, there'll probably be some young guy who's got a lot of dark hair. He's a tall, big, strong, good-looking guy, and he'll be standing up here, and he'll be preaching from this pulpit every week. And I don't know who he is, but I already don't like him. <laughs> you know, I'm kidding, right? But in the reality, in the fullness of time, that is going to take place for Jessamine Christian Church. He's probably out there right now in his late 20s or early 30s. And I'll be be his biggest fan. Whoever that is, I will cheer them on. But I won't, and we don't, ever retire. No, it's not the way it works. Someone says, as long as I have teeth, I'm going to chew on that old devil. And even when I lose my teeth, I'm going to gum him into distraction. And that's that's what we have to be. We have to have that mindset. 
Because I believe and I look at Caleb and his life and God honored him for his persistence to not quit, to never give up. I pray that God will give us all the kind of endurance that Caleb had, that we're thriving at 85 because he was. Let me give you one more example before we wrap up. But I think you look at the life of Caleb and you see the example of courage. He had been a brave soldier as a young man at the age of 40 years old. And we see him now just as courageous at 85. That he's still ready to go to battle. Look at the text. Look at chapter 14, verse 11. Caleb says, So here I am today. I'm 85 years old, and I am as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. That's 45 years ago. I'm as strong today as when Moses sent me out, and I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle as I was then. Now, perhaps that's true of him physically speaking, or maybe, and I think it more suggests that it means that he is just as strong in his faith in the Lord and the Lord's ability. He is just as strong today as he was then. Now, regardless if it was physical or spiritual, regardless, we know this, that this soldier of the Lord was ready to take that hill country because it had been promised. I know with time, our bodies change, our strength diminishes. I can't remember now, it's been several years ago, but I went into uh, the physical therapist. I played baseball from six T-ball all the way through high school. I pitched in college. After college, I played church softball from the outfield. My goal was to throw you out at first base. And I just destroyed this shoulder. So now I whine and I bellyache because my shoulder, I'm, I'm probably the only one in the room. But I broke down him to go see a physical therapist, and he kind of rubbed on it and massaged on it a little bit. And of course, these doctors today, man, they, they have a white coat and that says doctor, but you, you swear they're not even out of high school yet. They, live, they look younger and younger all the time. I'm not even sure he was shaving yet. But this is what he said Well, sir, a man of your age. Don't you love it? This is years ago. I was still in my 40s, man. I thought I was in the prime. A man of your age, this is probably just arthritis. And what happens? Yes, our bodies do get old and they do wear out. But I so appreciate, the Bible tells us in verse 12, that this land before Caleb was still heavily fortified. They still had more battles to fight, more cities to conquer, fortified cities, well defended by his enemies. And remember, these enemies were descendants of the Anakites. Now, who were they? Remember early in in Numbers, we talked about them several weeks ago. These were giants. They were like the first NBA players that we know in history. And they were big men. They were strong men. Nonetheless, Caleb was courageous. He was ready to advance. Folks, he was not moving into a furnished condo that was maintenance-free, which I think sounds like a great idea. I'm so tired of mowing my yard and picking up sticks and all the, you know, how it goes. That was not the route he chose. There was still work ahead for him. He had battles and it would take great courage. Folks, courage is the ability to face your fears and you keep moving forward. Some people say that courage is being the only one who knows how afraid you really are. Courage. But when you fight in God's strength, and that's what I think he meant. I didn't think it was a physical. I think he meant to be fighting in God's strength. And when you fight in God's strength, then no, you never retreat. When you follow the Lord with your whole heart, you'll never back up, shut up, or give up until you're caught up to heaven, we say. And I believe that's true. 45 years earlier, Moses had them, and they were in the land of Kadesh Barnea, And that's when he sent the 12 spies. Remember the kid song I referred to? None of y'all knew about it, but I grew up singing it. 12 men went to spy on Canaan. 10 were bad and 2 were good. I won't sing the rest of it, but that's the story here in the book of Numbers. So Moses sent in the 12 spies into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, it says, And we saw the Nephilim. They were the descendants from the giants. We saw the Nephilim, and we seemed like we were grasshoppers in in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. We spied out the land, and these guys are big, and they are giants, and we look like grasshoppers to them. And I know that there's probably a good chance someone in the room today, someone listening online, is suffering from what I would call grasshopper complex because we bought a lie 
You're thinking you're too small. You're thinking you're too insignificant. You think you're too, Im- uh, too unimportant. That you think you're small and you don't matter. And if you hear that long enough, you can't do it. If you hear that long enough, that you'll never amount to anything. You hear that long enough, you don't have what it takes. And you hear that long enough, and eventually you start believing that, and you buy into this grasshopper complex. But listen, I want to tell you, it does not matter what people tell you. It only matters what God says about you. And you are who God says you are, and you can do what God says you can do. Don't forget that. You are His child, and if God is for you, who can be against you, right? You are loved. You are His very own. You are a part of the church that Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail over His church. You are God's child. You are Christ's friend. You are God's temple. You are His workmanship. A masterpiece, the Scripture says. And you are a citizen of heaven. And that is who you are. That should put everything in life to perspective. Never forget, victories come in cans and defeat comes in can'ts. So we got to have the attitude that Caleb did. Caleb didn't deny there were giants in the land. If you go back this week and read the Old Testament story in Numbers, he didn't deny that, but listen to what he says in Numbers 14 and verse 9. Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Isn't that a great attitude? Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid. One translation reads, it's a paraphrase, but it says, Caleb Caleb is speaking, he says, these giants will be bread for us. You know, it's going to swallow them up. He's like saying, pass the peanut butter, we will eat their lunch, man. We've got this. But you remember when they wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness, the spies, the 10 bad ones that came back, they were whining and they were complaining. Look how big those giants are. We can't compare to them. And Caleb's attitude was, look how small those giants are compared to our big God. And they worried and they whined. They're too big for us to fight. And Caleb's like, they're too big for us to miss. And I like that attitude. Many of the giants that we are facing, you take a moment and think about maybe you have a giant in your life right now. Many of the giants that we are facing are the ones that we create in our own mind. Because it is a battle of the mind. When it comes to spiritual victory, I think the old comic strip, Pogo, I think he was right. He said, we have seen the enemy and he is us. And there's some truth to that. You know, the one person I have the most trouble with in in this entire church, the one person I have the most trouble with, is my wife's first husband. He gets on my everlasting nerve. Now, if you know my wife's story, she's only been married one time. We have seen the enemy, and he is me. And that's our reality. I'm just asking. You hear this message. you got to know I preached it first to myself and stepped on my own toes. And after I step on my toes, I get out of the way. Lord, maybe there's a message for the rest of everybody here. But that's our reality. This morning, I'm asking you, do you have the courage to fight against the giants that you're facing today? And I'll also say this, when you follow the Lord with your whole heart like Caleb did, then you will be able to face any giant if we can learn from his examples. In his book, One Crowded Hour, the author writes and tells a story from 1964 in Borneo. And the the Nepalese soldiers, they were called Gherkins. And the soldiers were taking order from a British commander. And he asked a squad of the Gherkins. He said, if we fly over the enemy, would you be willing to jump out of the plane in in combat against the enemy? And the sergeant pulled some of the other Gherkin soldiers together and came back to report to the commander and said, sir, we'll do it. We'll jump. If you'll just slow the plane down as slow as you can, and if you can get about 100 feet over those swamps, we'll do it. And the British commander said, A hundred feet, that's way too low. It won't even give you enough time for your parachutes to open. The soldier said, sir, I'm sorry, you didn't say anything about parachutes. Folks, that's courage, to jump out of a plane with no parachute. And we need to have that kind of courage. Ephesians 6 and verse 10, it says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the evil one. 
And listen, you may be here today with a very uncertain future. Or maybe you're here today and it seems like hope is on short supply in your life. But please remember, the tomb is empty. And Jesus is alive. And Paul said, we can do everything through Christ who gives us strength. And I don't know who wrote the poem, but I think this poem is a great way to wrap up the series and the story and the life of Caleb. As we've learned from these lessons of Joshua and how God honored Caleb with persistence and he honored Caleb. And I pray we all have the endurance to thrive at 85 like Caleb did. The example of courage he set. Here's the poem. It's from Caleb's perspective. He stood before Joshua with flashing eyes. Give me that mountain before I die. But Caleb, you're old and the mountain is high. Choose a a peaceful spot on the plains to die. The people who live in the mountains are strong. The battle you fight is bloody and long. His eyes never wavered. He spoke without fear. I've been promised that mountain for 45 years. And as for the people being mighty and tall, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. For it's not in my strength on which I'm counting. For the Lord's going to give me that there mountain. And so let's quit talking while it's still light. For the Lord and I have a battle to fight. And I pray that we all can take heart to those lessons from Caleb. And we never release God's promises. That we never retire from serving God. And we never retreat from our enemy. And if you're following the Lord with all your heart, with your whole heart, and you depend on His strength alone, you will be able to thrive for the Lord regardless of your age. Someday, and some people, they'll be depending on you. Last scripture and thought in 2 Timothy. I like this text because now the roles are reversed. It's actually an old seasoned saint like the Apostle Paul, and he's writing a letter to a young man in the faith named Timothy. And as he writes this letter as a mentor to a mentee, he says, Timothy... You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Endure hardships with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier ever gets involved in the civilian, the worldly affairs. But he wants to please his commanding officer. And I pray that's true for every one of you, that you live your life in such a way to please your commanding officer. Now, Father, I pray that as we come full circle in the life of Joshua and there's so many more lessons there's so much more conversations that could be had but Lord for today and for this season in the life of our church I just ask that you would stir in our hearts one the power of your word and what can be learned from that the example that Joshua has set for us I just pray Lord that that would just permeate through every person that's been giving a listening ear and a soft heart those who've been faithful week after week to be here and to worship who you are, Lord. Through the power of your word, I just pray you'll place a blessing on them for their faithfulness. And Lord, I just pray that a protective hedge around our church, I just ask you to help us to continue to, to love people well through the example that you have set for us. We pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that when we are weak in the flesh and we fail miserably, and we do, that in our weakness, Lord, that you would be strong. And our battle is in you, Lord, and through Christ and not of our own self. We love you, Father. This morning is for you. As we turn our attentions to a song of decision, Lord, I pray through the the stirring of the hearts and the soft hearts here that people would be courageous enough to come and confess you as their personal Lord and Savior. If there's someone here today that's never said that out loud publicly, declaring their faithfulness to Jesus to be united with Christ in a watery grave of baptism, to be united with Jesus in His death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, we will celebrate that with all the angels in heaven. Father, for those who are here who are already following You, Lord, I pray that they'll follow You with their whole heart. And So maybe, Lord, there's people that just need to rededicate themselves to following You more closely. And those that are struggling, if they need a word of prayer, a word of encouragement, that we'd be honored to do that for them and with them. Maybe there's people who just need to come to the steps here and just stand in the gap for other people and their family and their life that want to be praying for and praying with. Lord, you know the needs of the hearts today. We thank you for Jessamine Christian Church. What a great church family I love so dearly. There's people that have been coming. They've tried five, six, seven, eight weeks, however long they've been coming. 
Maybe, Lord, there's someone today that just needs to make Jessamine Christian Church their home so they can have a place to belong and a community to be an active part of to grow their faith. Lord, everything we do is for you. And we love you and we honor you in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.